Valentine's Day, and thank you for joining us. Super excited. This is the first time we've done this. And um, first of all, I think I know most of you, but I don't think I know all of you. So I'm Christy Belt Grossman. I'm the owner of Ops Boss Coaching. If you're not familiar with Ops Boss, we are all things operations, and that includes uh, TC company owners, TCs, directors of ops, COOs, all kinds of things um, inside and outside of real estate. So um, a number of us, I know we have a number of clients on the call as well as some new people, and we're in a new market, and we thought today would be just a great day to just sort of launch a mastermind to talk about some of the higher-minded topics. Now, I will tell you, we got way more questions than we can cover. We have one short hour. We're going to go really fast. Um, I'm going to invite you guys to come out of your behind the screens where you normally are, because I know most of you guys are probably working at home, um, doing your stuff with your teams all day, um, and come on camera and participate. So um, just to give you the caveats, I sent all this out to you in email. We have a really mixed group here today. We have people who are brand new that are opening transaction coordination companies this year who have not done any transactions that just want to learn. And we have people who did 3,000 transactions last year and who are super top experts. We want to keep the conversation high level. So I'm super happy to have all of you here, no matter how many transactions, you are not the numbers, right? You, Everybody has something to give, but I want to keep the, the conversation on a high plane. Um, this is not a how, how do I build my TC company and all that kind of stuff. There's lots of those um, seminars out there. So if you need help with that, reach out to me afterwards and I can help direct you on that. So I'm going to ask you guys to type into the chat. Tell us what states your TC company covers. And we'll flip down that real quick just so we can see where you guys all are. Okay. Kansas, Missouri, Idaho, Virginia, Maryland, DC, West Virginia, Florida, North Carolina, Texas, Georgia, Oklahoma, Illinois. Okay, good. So mostly Midwest and, and East Coast. So that's awesome. And now I want you guys to type in the chat, how many units um, did your transaction company close last year? 2,000, 550, 92, 268, 254, 1,700, 1,700, 133. Okay, so we're kind of a little bit all over the place, 2948. Mandy, I think you win with the, bit, with the biggest. So kudos on that. I'm appreciative that you're joining us today. So I wanted to, um, I sent you the questions out so you guys could think about them ahead of time. And my I got a little bit of feedback from people like, oh, those are that those first two questions are a little tough to start off with because uh, the first question was, it, today is Tuesday. If you had to sign 10 new teams by Friday, what are the first thing, three things you would do? And the second question was, today is February 14th. If you had to bring in 250 contracts by February, February 28th, what are the first th three things you would do? But I was very purposeful about that because I want to stretch our thinking to bigger instead of thinking incrementally. Um, but I also know that some of you on the call may be struggling with business. And I think we have some people that are thriving. I have some clients on the call who January 2023 was up over January 2022, and we have some people I know who were down over January 2022. So I wanted to introduce the concept and let you guys choose post-call whether you're going to go for stretch goals or small wins. If you are doing really well right now, then you that is the time that you want to set some stretch goals and really think big and take those really big actions because you're in a really good place. There was actually a Harvard business um, study on it called the stretch goal paradox. Um, so you can look that up later. If you are struggling, you're going to want to do the small win side. So as you're thinking and listening to some of the conversation that's happening today, you can think about, um, do I want to go big stretch? Do I want to go small wins? There's no right or wrong. There's just work, what works for you. So let's just launch in. I'm going to ask you if you are off camera to please come on camera now. Um, that was one of our rules for joining us today. So if you're not on camera, um, 
private message Brooke and let her know if there's a reason why you can't be on camera. Otherwise, we're probably going to cut you off the call because we want everybody to be on camera today. So let's launch with our first question. Our first question is, if you had to sign 10 new agents or 10 new teams by Friday, what are the first three things you would do? And I think we are a um, small enough group today that you can just come off camera and, and talk. So who wants to launch with an idea for what you would do? This is mastermind, not class. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, awesome. Chrissy Schellenberger, nice to meet everybody. I think I've, I've seen a lot of you before. Um, Christy, thanks for putting this together. I would say our business and our team are very relationship focused. So you have to have the service that's going to back it up. It can't just be relationships. You need to have amazing relationships and then have incredible service to back it up. So, and for me, when I say relationships, it's relationships with agents, it's relationships with title companies, lenders, my team. So our number one thing really is relationships. So I feel like I have a sphere of people. If I need something, I kind of have this core group who I would go to. So if I need to bring on 10 new agents, I might reach out to a title company and say, hey, you work with a lot of different agents. You know who needs help. How can we help them? So I would say everything that we do in our business is pretty relationship focused. Love that. And I think sometimes we think, oh, we've already done that, right? I've, I've already reached out to all my people, but the market is changing so much now that I think it's even more important than it was before because the people who need help are changing, mm -hmm. right? The, the people that had big teams, now they don't have as many people on their teams or the people that had an EA can't afford to keep the EA. So yeah. That I think out now is, really is an amazing important. time for TCs because, you know, people don't want to pay these big salaries. So now is a great time to kind of insert yourself and show your value and why the TC model can work so much better than potentially other, other models. Love that. Love that. Thanks, Christy. Thanks for jumping in. All right. Who else? What would you do? You have to get 10 agents or teams signed in the next three days. What are the first three things you're going to do? So I'm going to like reiterate a little bit what Chrissy says, because I was reading your question yesterday and the first thing that came to my mind was it's a lot harder for us to do that because it's not like, let me go show you a couple of houses and get your, and build your trust that way. It is you're trusting me with your business right off the bat. You're giving me, you know, access to your clients. You're giving me access to, to your business. And so it is not something that you can just start picking up the phone and cold calling agents and saying, hey, do you need ATC? Hey, do you need ATC? There's <clears throat> value has to be shown, um, you know, first. And the best way we've done that is either direct referral from current agents, lenders, title reps, um, or co-op agents that are getting to work with us on the other side. So we actually came back from Ops Boss Conference in October, and I said it a goal for all of our girls that they have to have two discovery calls each month like that is it's a non-negotiable um and so we are focusing on co-op agents and we are focusing on our um you know referral partners that that do it and you know it's a soft touch it's not something really aggressive like hey can you send me five people or anything like that it's do, do you know anybody right now you're working with that doesn't have anybody that you know needs help because those title companies and those lenders, most of the title companies, they know who's struggling. They know what agents are on the ball and which ones aren't. Um, and so that's been our our best bet right now in getting that done. I love that. And I love that you've um, invited your team into that too, and that you're not just doing it as leaders. Kim, you were about to jump in, I think, before. Thanks, Mackenzie. Hi, yeah, Kim Smith. Um, so... I, a lot of it is going to be piggybacking on what um, Mackenzie said and what Chrissy said and all of that, but um, we are reaching out to our current agents now. Um, some of them are, you know, switching brokerages and everything. So they're getting to know different agents and what their needs are and all of that. And the other thing that we're doing and um, regarding just like really, because again, it's like relationship business. Um, I have some relationships with some certain brokerages 
um, and reaching out to them because again, everybody just seems to be moving around. So they have new people coming in and it's not just like, it's also like the staff of the brokerages, like getting in with, you know, the, the um, onboarding person, the person that knows what's going on. So I've been doing that quite a bit also. Yeah, we were talking to, I forget, I think it was Bethany, maybe we were talking on the coaching call this week about talking to the brokers because the broker, the ones that do compliance and the ones that are always chasing down the agents, who are the agents they're chasing down that you could help make everybody's lives better. Yeah. Like and I'm just going to tag in there. So we're in the process of moving into a new state and that's how I have found kind of a way in is this state already has TCs that are established. They already know the companies that work there. But when you kind of start a relationship with the person at the front desk or the admin in the office, that kind of gets you higher up to different brokerages or different levels within the company. So we've kind of been using that method for expanding. Love that. Okay, what else? I'll just add in here as well. So if I had to get 10 new agents by Friday, I know our conversion rate, we would probably have to call 150 to 200 agents in order to get 10. And I would go to the MLS and search the top teams and or the individual agents. So, um, and then we would, you know, start calling, especially with the change in the market right now. So that would be, I mean, yes, we're a referral-based business. Yes, we have the vendors that we would call. But if I had to get 10 by Friday and it's Tuesday, I would be going all stops. Love that. What would you be saying to them, Mandy? Um, you if know, if they're cold calls. Yeah. In this changing market, are they struggling with keeping up with lead generating? Are they struggling with marketing their listings? Do they need leverage? I would be hitting on their pain points of what um, they're experiencing currently. Love that. Awesome. Carissa, you look like you're about to jump in. What would you do? Who else has what they would do? Three things. What would one of the things do be that you do to get agents signed by Friday on a Tuesday? The reason why I'm asking that question, because it, it's a little extreme, right? It's like, I, I got to get 250 contracts in, in the next two weeks, or I have, when you pick a number that's so big and extreme, it tends to push you to think of new ideas that you wouldn't have thought of before. Because when you ask the question, your mind will try to solve that problem. If you ask, how can I get one agent by Friday, your mind will solve that problem. But if you ask, how can I get 10? You might not get 10, but if you get eight or five, you're way better than one, right? So that's why I asked the question. Who else has something you would do that we haven't talked about? Or maybe that we did talk about. Sometimes the basics are the best. I would, I'm going to go back through my, uh, co my previous co-op agents and go back through and just check in with them during the new year, um, and see if they're in need of anybody right now, anybody that didn't respond on the initial follow-up when we closed. Yep. Yep. And I like that. I, I like the point that Mackenzie made. You've already demonstrated your value to those people. So you have a leg up there. What else? I have, I have a question and Chrissy, Stop me if this is not it, but we did this like middle of 2022. We were like hot on lead generation. We were in Facebook groups. We were, we were having, I was having like six or seven discovery calls a week. We were signing all these agents. But what we found though, when we were doing that and we did it for about three months, we signed like 15 agents. And I was like, oh great, we signed 15 agents. Only two of them ever sent a contract in. And so I'm curious how y'all are approaching that. Like, are y'all, are y'all doing anything when you're lead generating to make sure that like who you're signing is actually worth signing? Cause it's great to have a great list of agents, but they don't send anything. Then your work wasn't really, the effort's not there to kind of get the reward. Yeah. So that actually kind of, that's a great question and transitions us into the second question was, rephrase, if you had to bring in 250 contracts in the next 14 days, what would you do? So does anybody want to um, answer Mackenzie's question? I think that's a really good question. Mm 
we have a drip campaign for this. So when they sign up with us, if they don't send a file within a week or three weeks or 60 days, et cetera, we're dripping them in this, whether it's a call, email, or a text message. So I will say this is probably a gap that we are focusing on right now because yes, we, we do get them to quote unquote sign on, but we're also looking up their production in MLS. So if their production is they've only done four deals in the last year, we're probably not going to be super aggressive with them. <clears throat> I was reading last night that 50,000 realtors dropped out of NAR within the last quarter, the fourth quarter. Um, and so like, we're being super strategic on who we're talking to. Um, and we're not wasting our time on, you know, I, I don't mean to sound stereotypical, but the onesies and twosies that may not, you know, survive, um, you know, this year, et cetera. Yeah. 11. I don't think we have any California. I think 11,000 of that 50 was in California. So Bethany, you did some work along ideal client this year. Is there anything you want to share on that? Um, <laughs> not to put you on the spot or anything, <laughs> but you know, no, I was, I was actually thinking about that. I mean, we, we definitely experienced the same thing, you know, like Mackenzie was saying with, we sign up, you know, a handful of agents and we're like, okay, this is great. And then they don't end up sending anything or they send one. Um, I think our approach has been similar to Mandy. We have a new client workflow or drip campaign that we follow. Um, so the idea would be to convert them into a actual client in that first eight weeks mm -hmm. through that follow-up. But then after that, we have a tracking of like, if it's been 90 days since they've sent a contract, we're reassessing like, why, why haven't we gotten anything in 90 days? Um, is it because they're not doing any business? Have they made a change? So we're being proactive about assessing that. And then at the six month mark, they drop off as a client. So we consider paying clients within six months who we're working with. So they drop as a client, but that doesn't mean we stop following up with them. It just changes our approach. You guys also did a lot of work this year around with your team on identifying your ideal client so that you're proactively looking for who you want to be in business with versus defaulting and lead generating to everybody. Yeah. Right? In terms yeah, of we, Yeah, we we definitely take a pretty strong assessment on volume, but then not just volume but also like the type of agent that they are, is it someone we want to be in business with? So in our initial onboarding and in our initial conversations and contracts we're working on with them. Are there red flags? Are there reasons we should get out of business with this person? Or are they not doing a lot, but they have a lot of potential? So there's someone that we want to, you know, cultivate that relationship with. Okay, so back to lead gen. Thank you. Um, any other lead gen ideas that what's working well for you right now? So we've got relationships, reaching out to your trusted sphere. Mine's probably a little longer play than, than by Friday, but like I just did a presentation for our Women's Council of Realtors on last week and I went and got in front of them for an hour and taught like a little mini class, but I've gotten like four or five inquiries from that class. Cause of course they allow me to mention the fact that I own a TC company and blah, 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 blah. But I think just providing value within the market and like everybody's saying, you know, these, these agents are only doing onesie twosie deals. Well, if you have a small TC company, I, I know Bethany and Mandy probably don't have time to do this, but my thought is how can I provide value to these agents that aren't doing as many deals to help them get more deals? Like I'll take any agent right now. I'm in a small market. We don't have, you know, there's 900 total agents in my market. I don't have a giant pool of people to pick from. So how do I provide value and training and coaching to those agents as like a a funnel to get people into my transaction company business. Yeah. But uh, of course that's a longer play. You're not going to get, you know, 10 new clients by Friday, but you're definitely going to continue. Well, to we've got to have long plays and short plays both. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, we do what Stephanie do. does. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. We need to um, support agents um, in their brokers open. So it's kind of similar. So getting in front of people, you're supporting who that agent is, but you're also putting yourself in front of any of the agents who come through the house. 
So that has been, um, you know, the agent who is our agent, who it's their open house, they feel great that we're there and we're supporting them and providing water or cookies or something small. But it, for us, it's also an opportunity to get in front of more people. Love that. I want to reiterate what Stephanie said, because as much as we love to look at volume and things like that, um, I think if anybody looked at numbers at 2022, you know, looked at the progression of the last three years, the market was so inflated. And, you know, I've had some conversations with some agents this last couple of weeks. And, um, you know, one agent of ours that did 90 transactions, he's only planning on doing 45 this year because the investment group that he was working with went and found a broker to sponsor one of their guys and they hired someone in house. And so, you know, he just lost a, a good chunk of his business. But then in the same instance, we had a guy that signed with us. He had done three contracts and he signed with us. Um, his team last year closed 97 and they're on track to do like 130 this year. And so those onesies and twosies sometimes will surprise you. They don't always, um, but I've also learned too that those baby agents, that's what I call babies, like agents under two years, they haven't closed more than 20 transactions. Those baby agents, they need that um, person to talk to because a lot of these brokers don't give transactional support. They don't have that open line of communication with their agents that they can call and ask questions. And so us seeing as many contracts as we see, they know they can pick up the phone and call, um, you know, us and get advice. What was going on? What have you seen? Is this normal? What's the contract say? Is it, you know, a question we usually get. Um, and so we kind of like said, we try not to count those little guys out because sometimes they're your best referral partners. Um, but, you know, it is a long-term play. It might not show up for a couple of years. And I would add on the reverse side, I've heard a little bit of um, commentary around, oh, well, they're a big team. Uh, they're not going to do business with us. They don't need a transaction coordinator. I will tell you guys, I'm getting weekly text messages from people who have been in our industry on the operations side on real estate teams for 10 plus years who are awesomely talented people who are letting being let go because their team can't afford it. And the teams are still doing business. They're just not doing enough business to keep them. And that's an opportunity for all the TC companies. Um, okay, so let's move on to um, really quickly. Or if, and if you guys want to circle back to that because you think lead gen's the most important thing, I'm happy to do that. But I'm going to move to the next question, which was, are you using automation and AI to scale your lead gen? How are you using it or how could you use it? We're doing a, an AI panel two days from now, I think, the day after tomorrow. But I specifically was wondering if anybody was using that to scale your lead gen activities and what does that look like? I don't know if anybody's doing that. Carissa, I know you're on our panel in a couple of days. Are you using it for lead gen or for other things? For other things, not really for lead gen. I've, I've used it to generate some emails, um, like different email campaigns um, that I've used for lead gen. So I guess in that sense, yes. But um, okay. yeah, I've, yeah. Okay. It was just a thought. I think it's a, there's a, a huge opportunity there because time when you're a business owner is, very, is your most valuable thing. So how could you use AI for your newsletter, for your drips, for your social media, whatever the stuff that takes a lot of time? I feel like there's a great opportunity there. What does lead gen look like on your calendar? Those of you who are doing, let's say, I don't know, no, let's not, not your brand new people, but those of you who are, have significant businesses, what does lead gen look like on your calendar? It's probably going to look all different for all different people. Or is it on your calendar? Uh, one thing that has been really successful for me, that's definitely a, a longer play, uh, but I've partnered with some of the smaller brokerages in the area. So one thing I learned recently is the average broker average brokerage size is 12 agents, which is way smaller than what I thought. And especially coming from like a Keller Williams background where most of the brokerages are 200 plus agents, that was really surprising to me. But when I started looking into that, there were so many smaller, like 30 or less, uh, 30 agents or less brokerages in my area that pretty much had no admin at all, or the broker was trying to do that. And I offered to teach a class to all new agents 
all agents that join the brokerage of what the brokerage requires for compliance and kind of the expectations for the contract to close process from beginning to end. And then my little shtick at the end of the class is simply, if you hire me, I do all of these things for you. And you only do these, like circle these three things out of the whole presentation. You do those three things. I do everything else the end sign up here. And I can usually get almost every person in that class to sign up. So I do probably two of those a month at different offices that I kind of rotate around. So I come to either like a sales meeting or a specific training that they set up. And I go through either a 20 minute version of that or like an hour long version of that. And uh, it's been really great to just pick up, really consistently pick up agents from some of those smaller brokerages. Yeah, the blue ocean, right? It's it's a vast out there. I just heard that statistic this past week as well. It's pretty shocking. Love that. Thanks, Carissa. Okay, so what does lead gen look like? So on your calendar, you're doing two trainings per week. That's part of your lead gen. What else is what what does your calendar typically look like? Are you time blocking for prospecting? Are you time blocking for activities? What does it look like? Are you just fitting it in? what's working well and what's not working. I'm going to use Melanie as an example because she's doing, they are both now doing a lot of it, but she was doing a majority of it to begin with. But at first it was like she picked a day and was doing all of her legion on one day. And then um, we did some discussing and some researching and, and now she has um, an hour blocked out three days a week for it. Um, now she may not use that entire hour. Sometimes she may go back and use social media in that in that hour, or whatever. But it is on her calendar. Um, and she used Hannah's tip, I think, about color coding your calendar, like reds and greens and yellows or whatever. And so she has it on there in red and and is utilizing it that way. Um, and I think that someone like her, who is constantly has her calendar up and is looking at it, um, it works. But if you're not somebody that has your calendar up on your screen all day long and is referencing back, it's probably not as beneficial because you're, you don't know what time it is. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing at that point. So, um, but doing it every day was too much for her. It was too much of that expectation. So we started it small and then broke it down and moved it across. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I color code my calendar as well. I have Dark green is cash, so all my lead gen is in dark green on my calendar. Who else? I wish I could say that I time blocked. I started out time blocking, um, but it that wasn't successful for me because I found myself getting frustrated with that. I've discovered there are two days of the week where I am not as busy with contracts that I tend to do ba- a lot of batching for different things. Um, and then I have my set times where I'm already signed up for a networking group. And then from there, I know where my hours um, can be where I do go to brokerages and I do, you know, if I, if I need to schedule a class, I do it on that day. So, um, I just kind of pick those two days where I can get a lot of batching done and that way it's all ready for the next week. Yeah. I like that too. I like looking at it as a week as a whole versus a day, every day being the same. Yeah. Anyone else want to add anything on that before we go into leadership and accountability questions before anything else on lead gen? as a whole. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we had um, some questions come in and I thought let's share our favorite scripts to use when you're having a challenging conversation either with an agent, we all have those, right? And then those of us who have teams, you have challenging conversations sometimes with team members too. So what is your favorite script to use when having a challenging conversation with an agent? This could be on any topic. So I actually have um, a couple of things to say about this. So I do not, I don't tend to follow scripts very much because I, I prefer to have our, the conversation feel very authentic and, and not rehearsed, um, because that's a very important value for me and my relationship with not only my agents, but also with my team. 
so my approach to having a difficult conversation is to always start out with questions and trying to gain understanding because that's going to impact how I proceed with the conversation. Uh, it, I'm going to uncover whether there are issues with training and not knowing how to do something. I'm going to discover if it's an issue with discipline and not wanting to do something, and then working through and getting the agreement of the agent or the team member on how we can move forward and both achieve our goals related to that. So that's the, the strategy that I use when I'm having accountability conversations. Yeah. So actually, and let me just inject there, Amity, I'll push you a little bit and say, that's actually a script. It's not written out and memorized the way we sure. think of the script, but you probably, if I listen to 20 of your phone calls are probably saying fairly similar things in sure. asking the questions. And then, so what actually, I love that you brought it up that way though, because it reminded me, Bethany, of a conversation we were having this week about teaching the framework of conversations to our team members, how you approach conversations, how you make decisions, um, what is your framework would have been a better question than your script. But either way, scripts and framework, same, in my yeah. mind, same thing. Yeah. So yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. So asking questions, discovering the, the issues, understanding what they are, and then coming up with a solution. Yeah. All right, who I'll, else wants? Um, I'll, I'll chime in. So mine's kind of a combination of both of those because there are certain things that come up throughout a transaction or throughout a relationship with an agent or a buyer or seller. So I feel like we have developed some scripts for my team to use in certain situations. So maybe that's our framework. Um, but me as maybe the, the business owner or the leader, I like my conversations to be a little more off the cuff too. So I think we all kind of have similar answers to certain problems, but I like my my conversations to be really authentic. So I that definitely rang true with me too. So I think your team needs a framework for how to answer questions that pop up all the time. So we have that. And then I handle, you know, the bigger problems. And when you have a team and a company, I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't have a difficult conversation with somebody. So I, I do like those to be as authentic as possible. Chrissy, you are really good at having difficult conversations. What is what is a tip you would share with other people, either your thought process, your approach? I would say because um, you're not in there are some people I know that struggle with put off, avoid conversations, and you always go right to the conversation. Yeah, I mean that's probably a good part of the tip is is having the conversation, not letting it linger, jumping right in, um, being authentic. And I definitely keep the emotion out of it. I know that can be harder depending on your personality, but I really try to keep things unemotional and I try to keep an open mind and not make it about me. Um, I'm a solution oriented person. So it's more about finding what the problem is and then finding a solution. But I also have people on my team who are super emotional, very emotional. So I think it's also important to know who you're having a conversation with and kind of how you need to have a conversation with them. So, I mean, I think everyone here knows DISC and I don't live and die by DISC, but I know what DISC is and I kind of like it as a guide. So Christy and I have talked about this a couple of times. Sometimes I'll pull up a DISC profile and be like, okay, here's a hard conversation I need to have. For me, it's like direct, it's answer the question, move on. But that's not what it is to the person who I'm speaking with. So you kind of need to, I think leadership for me, I've learned so much about it in the past couple of years. It's psychological and you have to think more about the other person and how they're going to interpret what you say or what you ask. So I think digging into the other person to have the conversation you need to have in a way that they're going to understand the questions and be able to help solve the problem. Mm, I love that last bit. I think sometimes we have the conversation and we start solving the problem before we really discovered what the problem is, because oftentimes yeah. the problem presented is not the problem that needs to be solved. Right. But yeah. sometimes we were talking about this on our team last week, sometimes just having the conversation brings up other things that you need to come clean about or figure out or sort through. So I think 
I have other people on my team just being able to talk through situations. It shows you what you might need to fix or change. So I think just being willing to have um, open, non-emotional, but aware conversations. Yeah, love that. Who else wants to jump in? I have a little bit different background in real estate than most of, but I, I started as an operations, and it starts there, but I started as an operations manager at 21. And I was young and dumb and stupid and a hothead um, dealing with 15 agents that were all men, all under the age of 30, and all thought they were smarter than me. They probably were, most of them were. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, over time, that conversation has evolved in how I talk to people. Um, talking to men is different than talking to women. Talking to agents is different than talking to operations people. And so you kind of have to have that, that mind frame. Um, the book, Nonviolent Communication, was a game changer for me um, in learning how to structure your conversations, how to start structure your questions. Um, you know, one thing I always start any conversation, whether it's an agent or um, a team member, is are you calling to vent? are you calling for a solution? Because sometimes they just want to be heard and they don't actually want a solution. They just want to vent. They don't, they just want to talk. Um, and, and that this is Valentine's be- day. So we can all share that tip with our husbands too. Right. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. I, my, uh, my work husband or as, well, as I call him, I always did. He'll come in my office all mad. I'm like, do you want a solution? Cause I'll give it. Or are you, are you just wanting to vent? Cause this, this conversation is going to go a different way. Um, so, you know, of what that is, I did learn the hard way over, you know, the last couple of years that perception is not always reality. And you can have an agent call you mad at your TC or your team member, and then you, you know, get in your feelings about it one way or another, and you call the other person and, you, you know, whether how you handle that, you know, also is important. Um, so I always try to have both like open conversations with both sides before doing anything. And then I have learned and is a rule in our book that we do not make decisions or have conversations on the team unless everybody's on the call. So if we're having conflict between like a TC and an agent, uh, the agent feels like the TC did something or the the TC feels like the agent did something. um, I talk to them individually and then we schedule a call to get on the phone um, together because I don't think it's fair to have conversations about people when they're not on the call. And people are a lot more willing to say things that are hurtful when they don't feel like the other person's going to hear it. Or they don't feel like the other person's going to, um, yeah. you know, know what they're being said. And I think that it's more as, as a leader in those situations, we have to be more of a mediator than we do the decision maker. Ultimately, yes, if there's a decision being made, you know, it falls back on us. But a lot of time that decision can be made between the two of them or they'll figure out where that gap in communication was or where the ball Yeah, dropped. you can help facilitate the communication. Yeah, and so I think I want to always empower our girls to do that. I want them to learn how to have those conversations with the agents because it's important. And I don't want them always have to, to rely on me to have those conversations. Yep. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of our framework for, for what we do. And it's worked really well, um, you know, in some situations and then in some it, it doesn't. But also when it doesn't work, they're usually not a fit for, for our organization. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Mackenzie. Who else wants to contribute framework scripts, tips for challenging um, communication? I've been coaching with a, a Gallup Strength Finders coach for the last five years. And one of the most powerful things he's ever taught me is um, going into those conversations, knowing what I can and cannot control. Um, I cannot control their emotional response. I might be able to predict it, like Chrissy talked about, when I know their disc and I know enough about them, I might be able to kind of guess how they might respond in that conversation and I can adjust and plan accordingly, but I can't predict or control, I'm sorry, I can't control how they are going to respond. I can control how I will respond. And the thing that's most important for me when I go into that, those conversations is I want to know upfront what my goal is in the conversation. So for example, I know that this conversation will be successful if at the end of the conversation, I feel like I was clear, I made it like it was concise what I was trying to get across 
whatever that goal is, but I go into that conversation having this is a specific goal. And if we can get to the end of that conversation with that goal met, then the conversation was a success, regardless of how anybody's feelings are at the end of that. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to intentionally injure or, you know, hurt those, that person's feelings by any means, but being able to that really helps to being able to set all that aside and go in towards that goal of this is what I can control. I can control the goal and I can control my emotional response and the rest of that's outside of my control. That's awesome. Thanks, Carissa. Really good. I think you have to be clear on the outcome you're looking for, right? Are you looking to just gather information? Are you looking to make a decision in the conversation? Are you looking to schedule another follow-up conversation? What is the outcome you're looking for? And knowing that before you start the conversation. Anything else, scripts? Tough conversations? I look at them as opportunity conversations, right? I, I didn't choose it. They're not always tough conversations. Usually something good comes out of those conversations, some sort of growth, some sort of new opportunity, some new uh, topic to explore or area to explore for you or for the other person or both. Or maybe you get out of business with someone and that's a good, op that's a good result as well right? I know a lot of you went probably when you started did business with agents that you didn't love. And the longer you're in business, the more you're doing business with agents you love, right? So there, it can go both ways. Okay, so let's move on to learning and growth. Um, I pulled this question, what is something you learned last month that was new to you and may benefit others? Um, I don't know if you guys have looked, but I had a post, we did a blog post about um, topics for an admin mastermind. And Ben Franklin had a, a mastermind that went for years and years and years and years. And if you pull up the blog post, you'll see the questions that they used to ask. And they're actually fascinating questions. So go look those up later. But um, the one that popped out to me was, what is something you learned last month that was new to you and may benefit others? So the beauty of a mastermind is that we can all accelerate our learning through one another. And this can be anybody. I know some of you guys are probably sitting quiet thinking I'm I'm new, I'm opening my business or I'm not doing the numbers that somebody else is, but we can all learn from one another. Nobody learned anything new last month? I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, it, it's kind of going off of what everybody's been saying about the nurturing, um, the relationships, which is kind of like lead gen. Um, I was nurturing somebody more for a TC to partner with and it didn't work out, but that relationship grew so that when something didn't work out with her agent, her agent reached out to me. So it's, it's nurturing the relationship. So that's something that I realized, even though something didn't materialize, the relationship, nurturing, continuing to nurture a relationship can lead to something that you didn't envision. I love that. And I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, Mandy, you'll, I think you'll be okay with me saying this. I get people that say, why do you have other people at your retreats or on your calls who are with other organizations and who do coaching? And I'm like, because I can learn from them and they can learn from me, right? So nurturing relationships. Mandy and I have known each other for a long time. Mandy's a coach with another, with her own company, I guess. Um, but she also has a lot to share. So I'm, I'm glad that you're here. That was a good one, Lori. Our industry is a really small industry, right? So relationships are super important. And thank you for letting me be here. <laughs> yeah, glad to have you. I'll Actually, jump in. I'm going to jump. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Elizabeth. I'm going to jump in on the last person because I just wanted to um, 
what I've learned is that what I've been doing like works and you have to keep doing it because it may not be showing right away, but it's really, this is all a long-term game because we're constantly lead generating just like agents and work. So we have to constantly be continuing to do all the things, um, for, for lead generation. And when you stop, um, that's when your business starts to go down. I've actually seen a pretty good return as of recently, just with what I've been doing and what my plans were. So it, you're being watched and people miss you when you're not doing the things. Awesome. Yeah. Consistency is key, right? We tend to give up right when we're about to have that success. And I think we're all feeling that right now, middle of February, six months in, all the enthusiasm is starting to drop a little bit. Um, I'm seeing it on the real estate teams as well. And now's the time where we have to just captain of consistency, keep doing the things. Kim, what were you going to say? Um, well, about what something that I learned last month and everything, and it's something more on a personal side, but I'm kind of implementing into the professional side and everything, but it's stuff that I did with my family, my husband and my two kids and everything where I made them sit down and do the five love languages and also do their communication style. And most importantly, also their conflict style, like how do you handle conflict? And so I've been, you know, just kind of like thinking about like different roadmaps, even like our different agents and how they handle things, who avoids, who's passive aggressive, you know, all those kinds of things. So um, it, it goes hand in hand in that relationship building, whether it's, like I said, personally and also professionally, because obviously it bleeds all into one. So, yep. I love that. I love involving. I think in our industry, our industry is so growth minded, right? As a whole, at least those who are the high achievers in the industry, it's fun to take those things back and share them with your family and help them grow too. Kim, I love the love languages. I love, love, love it. And I haven't used it with any of our agents. So maybe that's something I could find a way to incorporate. Um, but I love knowing that information about my team. So you can show the people on your team how they want to receive love. And I first learned about it through my husband too. So we kind of did it because we're so different and I want to show him love in a way that he doesn't receive love. So we really had to work through that. And then I brought that over to my team and I just, I love the love languages and I would have to think about how to kind of incorporate that into a professional way too. They have love languages in the workplace, which is really good. Yeah. And they have a, you can be on their email list. They send out a, a tip a day and yeah, for different things. I like that. Um, I'll share that ours is, um, you know, we've been in this referral business, um, really for the last three years on a high level. And then when we had to start pivoting about six months ago, something I'm continually learning is how many touches it takes to convert an agent on a drip and how many phone calls it takes and how many text messages. Cause you know, there's no MREA for TCs or anything like that. So, I mean, we're using some of the agent models, of course, but you know, we're still learning daily, weekly, monthly on what's working, what's not working, what, what message in the subject line is working, what's not, you know, the email body, um, and then nurturing our current agents as well, which is something, you know, we were doing, but not really consistently with a newsletter, et cetera. So, um, you know, I will say that, um, that is a big thing for us. Yeah. And I think the bigger your business gets, the more important all of that tracking becomes, right? Because it's one thing when you're the one doing everything, but if you're growing a team and you're growing a big business, you have to have predictable business can't have predictable business without knowing the numbers of your business. So I love that you shared that. That's awesome. Um, okay. We had Steph, I didn't ask you to prepare this, but that maybe you are, you did by looking at the questions, what did you read last month and what did you implement as a result? I know you read something that you were like, ah, everybody has to read this. What was it? Yep. It was come up for air by Nick Sonnenberg. And I actually, um, Liz and I actually got the pleasure of watching him on a um, mastermind he did for the Go Abundance Champions for the company I work for right now. And he is a, he's worked with 
um, top 10 companies in the world. Like we're talking the Amazons, the Facebooks on efficiency. And probably the one thing that hit me like a ton of bricks was that um, most times we are optimizing our companies for speed of transfer of information. How do I get it off my plate as fast as possible instead of speed of retrieval of information? How do I put it somewhere so that no one has to ask me where it is and everybody knows exactly where to go to get the information to save time and efficiency within the company? So I'm not I'm not the bottleneck. People don't con hey, where is that? Or where do I find this? Or how do I find this? And so as I've been building my stuff for champions that that keeps rattling around in my head how do i do this for speed of efficiency and the same thing's ringing true in my tc business how do i make sure that all the information is put where everybody knows it is supposed to be and and the analogy he used we all we all understand this concept in our lives we don't take our clothes out of the dryer and shove them in a drawer we take them out and we fold them and we put them away so that when we get dressed, I know where my socks are, where my shirt is and where my pants are. I don't have to like dig through every piece of laundry to find the one I'm looking for. So, Well, some of us may have to do that and we may need to read the book. Yeah, but really cool. He has a, he has a CPR method, a framework for just organizing your business for efficiency. Like it's all about how do you make your business the most efficient that it can possibly be. Um, most of the big teams he worked with, they saved on average an eight hour workday per employee wow. when they reorganize their business. Very cool. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mackenzie, the morning Mackenzie just said, Stephanie, you're just adulting at a higher level than me. Laundry basket big is my morning routine. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all relate to that. What else did you guys read and implement? that somebody else could benefit from. I hear a lot of people reading books, but not implementing what they read. So that's why I asked it that way. I am reading, well, I'm back in college because that's fun. So I'm uh, taking three economic classes right now. So I'm reading a lot about economics, but um, being in the commercial world, um, our world's a little bit different as far as like how our market trends with economics. So. I have been digging into a lot of economic trends. How does that affect the market? What does it look like, you know, in a 12 month, 18 month, 24 month framework? Um, and it, you know, the market cycles, and we all know that. And I think that having a better idea of what does that cycle look like? What are the differences in this cycle we're in versus the previous cycles? Um, have been a really good framework for both companies as far as like what to expect. So I'm having conversations, you know, with the commercial team of like, here's what I'm seeing, here's what rates are doing, here's what I think is going to happen, here's what they're saying is going to happen, here's what we need to plan for. And then I'm also having that conversation with the TC team of, hey, here's what's going on, here's what I think it's going to do for residential real estate, residential real estate rates. When the rates have done this, this is what has happened. And, you know, being able to plan for those changes, because our business relies on other people in the sense that we can't go out and sell houses for these people. So if their business is suffering, not necessarily because of lack of effort, but because of, you know, economic situations, we have to prepare for that in, in all senses of the word. Love that. Thanks. What else? What, did, what have you read and implemented this year? So this is probably not, this is not the answer you're looking for. I'm going to say probably. But something that I'm trying to implement this year, as you know, is some time for myself to experience joy with that time, like really just do it. But with that is getting back into reading and reading books that aren't for business. So if you need a different recommendation, I've gotten into the Colleen Hoover book um, that my TC has recommended. She'll bring in a new book for me every couple of weeks. So it's a good, easy read to have non-business time implemented if anyone needs something separate from this. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm glad you brought that up. That's super important. I'm super, super passionate about it. And if you want to have a successful business, you have to have a personal life and a creative life and all the things outside like Amity, your cooking thing that you do or whatever it is like that fuels your soul, it fuels your heart, and that fuels your business. 
right? If we just are like all business all the time, it, we get stale. Our business doesn't grow. That's awesome. Love that. Um, so, um, I ahead, am reading. Hi, um, I'm reading Atomic Habits, and <laughs> so I'm so trying good. to implement new habits. And one of the things, don't judge, is really hard for me is to follow a schedule. Like I can put on the calendar all day long, but do I follow? Well, kids, something come up with the kids. First of all, I'm a full-time mom um, first than anything. So it's really hard for me to follow. So I started a really small, you know, one, one thing personal, one thing business. Um, so I've been doing this for over a month. Um, you know, one is work out every day. Probably you saw me walking in the beginning. That's where I was before. And one is the uh, legion at least one hour a day. Is that my favorite thing to do? Absolutely not. But the way I start doing is I rewarding myself once I get those things done. I love it. What do you, re what does a rewarding yourself look like? So I am not in my favorite thing, Legion. I, it's not. But if I Legion, I get to one day I get to leave early um, and pick up my kiddos. Like yesterday, I Legion. I went for um, lunch and had a lunch with my my daughter. So I really make painful because I tell my kids what I'm going to do. And if mm -hmm. I don't show up, I'm going to disappoint them. Kids are like the best accountability partner. Yes, they are. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be your own kids. Like if you have kids, nieces, nephews, whatever in your life, find kids in your life. They never forget anything that you tell them you're going to do. That's awesome. Yeah. So yesterday morning, I told my daughter, I will come for lunch, but I have to do my legion. So if I didn't show up, she would be very disappointed. So I better do it. I love that. Beautiful. Awesome. What else? We have two minutes left. What's on your mind or what do you want to share? What's one thing you heard? Oh, go ahead, Courtney. I will share that something small I've been doing lately is making a list of how to win the day. Like if I get these 10 things done, then I'm going to go to bed at night and go, I won the day. I did it. I made progress. So it's kind of being accountable to myself too. Yeah. And it, I would encourage 10 is a lot. <laughs> I was going to say I get up. I, my rule is I have to have the three things before my feet hit the ground, getting out of bed to know how I win today. But I think I it's important in today's market to count our wins. Yeah. I do a sticky note because my um, to-do list is ever going and it it's in a notebook. And so I um, have really bad ADHD. And so I think that I can get the entire list done in, in that day. Um, and so I had to move to a sticky note. And so I pull so many things. If it can't get on the sticky note, I don't do it. So, I, you know, I move over those things to the sticky note and then I focus on those. So I still have my list, but my sticky note's my, my focus. Love it. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming and sharing today and being with us and sharing the love. Happy Valentine's Day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Don't eat too many cookies and candies and be sweet to everybody. But thanks for coming. Really enjoyed it and learn, learning with you guys today. Thanks for pulling it together. Thank you, Thank you Christy. Our pleasure. Thank Bye, you. guys. Valentine's Day. Thank you.